Lord, you are great and greatly to be praised. We worship in this place. Yes, God. Declaring Jesus that you have a name above every name. Yes, God. There is no name higher than yours. And we worship you this day. Join us. How great is our God. Yes. Sing with me. How great is our God.
You shall wear a golden crown. Mm. You know what Paul said? Paul says, uh, all of those will receive a crown who look forward to the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for by that time they will have fought the good fight of faith. Amen, amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we are just thankful, Lord, for this day, and we're thankful, Lord, for these moments of worship. Uh, we're thankful, Lord, for family. We're thankful, Lord, for friends. We're thankful, Lord, for the unity uh, that you are creating among us through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask now, Lord, that as we open the book, as your word is shared, as it is preached, as it is taught, uh, we pray, Lord, that you open our hearts to receive it. And even as Moses ascended up on the mountain and he humbled himself, he bowed down before you, he took off his shoes. May we, in like manner, bow down before you, and we ask in humility that you would speak to us. Speak to us right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Uh, let the church say amen. 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 My brothers and sisters, if you would, turn in uh, your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 16. Exodus chapter 14, 10 through 16. And then uh, put your finger there and turn to Joshua chapter 7 verses 7 through 12. I believe that there are some similarities uh, in these two texts that I just want to point out to you. Exodus chapter 14, beginning with verse 10, and Joshua chapter 7, <clears throat> beginning with verse 7. All right, we're going to start with Exodus. Exodus 14, verse 10. From the Word of God. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people. He said, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Now that got me right there. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites, to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. All right? Now let's look, look at uh, Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, verse 7, the context is this. Israel had just defeated uh, the city, the walled city of Jericho. As you know, the walls came, <laughs> the songs came, tumbling down. And then they went to the next city, and it was called Ai, or Ai. And they were defeated at Ai. And so we're going to pick up uh, with Joshua right after this defeat. Joshua chapter 7, verse 7. And Joshua said, Alas, alas, sovereign, uh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy 
whatever among you is devoted to destruction. May the Lord uh, bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Uh, let the people of God say amen. Amen. Eternal God, our Father, we are thankful once again for your presence. Be with us now. Open our hearts. Open our minds that we may receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The subject of our sharing is, why are you crying out to me? That's what, that's what God said to Moses. Why are you crying out to me? Well, first of all, I want you to know that I consider both Moses and Joshua to be men of authority. You know, we've been talking about walking in the authority that God has given us as his sons and at his, as his daughters. So Moses and Joshua are both men of authority. Uh, they both had a relationship with God. Uh, they had experience. They had history, in other words, in dealing with God and also in being dealt with by God. They were both used by God in extraordinary ways. And last but not least, the Spirit of God was upon them, all right, and empowered them to do exploits during their time. And when I read about these men now, it wasn't always like this, but, but now I think of you, my brothers and sisters, I think of you as being comparable to them. That's right. Not that I think that you're going to do the exact same things that they did, but, but, but if you believe the Lord Jesus has saved you, then you are, number one, a son or daughter of God, and that gives you authority. If Jesus is your Lord, then you have a relationship with him. You ought to have experience. You ought to have some history with God. Uh, you have had dealings with God, and currently, my prayer is you are being dealt with by God. And you have the Holy Spirit of God. You have the Spirit of Christ living on the inside of you. And in that respect, you are more like Moses and Joshua than you are like the people they were leading. Why? Because you also have the Spirit. In the Old Testament now, only those leaders really had the Spirit of God upon you. And right now, in our new era, in the new under the new covenant, we all have the Holy Spirit, if that is, you believe in the Lord Jesus. Now, now, in the four, first portion of our text, all right, in Exodus chapter 14, after uh, Pharaoh set the Israelites free, the Bible tells us that God told Moses to have the people of Israel to set their camp by the Red Sea. But after the Israelites left, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh had a change of heart, and he sent his army after them to bring them back into Egypt. And when the Israelites camped by the sea, saw the Egyptian army approaching them in chariots and on horsemen in battle formation, the Bible says they were terrified. And they cried out to the Lord, and they blamed Moses because they literally had nowhere to go. The Egyptian army was coming towards them, and the sea was at their backs. But the Bible says that Moses stood up, and he spoke up, and he said to the people, do not be afraid. He said, stand firm. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord because the Egyptians that you see today, you will never see again. He said, the Lord will fight for you. And he said, and you, and the, the New King James Version said, and you shall hold your peace. In other words, you shall be quiet. Now, now it was a very tense situation to say the least, right? But then, but then something happens between verses 14 and 15 that leads me to believe that even after Moses made that great speech, even Moses had a moment of uncertainty because in verse 15, look at what it said. In verse 15 it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move forward. You raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide it so that the children of Israel can go through that sea on dry ground. Now, now the fact in this text, the fact that God said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? That just blows my mind because who else would Moses cry out to, huh? Maybe initially that's why I brought this text to you in the first place because I wanted you to help me to understand what God was saying to Moses and why he was saying it to Moses. But I know it's not a Bible study. I know it's not a discussion, so I'm going to have to carry on, right? It's almost as if in this text, it's almost as if God is like a coach. 
and he's telling his ball player, don't look at me. You've got three seconds left. There are no timeouts. Go ahead and take the shot. Seems like that's what Moses, that's what God was saying. Or perhaps, perhaps it is indicative of what it means to walk in authority as a son or as a daughter of God where, where God pushes us where God challenges us to think beyond where we currently are to where we need to be, or where God challenges us to dream or to envision the impossible, where he challenges us to envision what it means to be in partnership with God. That's right. I believe that God wants us to take us from where we are to where we need to be. You know, so often among our people, we get caught up in the past. But you know what? We can't go back there. You can't go back to the 70s. You can't go back to the 80s. You can't go back to the 90s. You better look at where you are and then look at where God wants you to be. Listen, listen, listen. I'm going to tell you something. When you look at this text, Moses already knew. Moses already knew something was up when God told him to camp by the sea in the first place. That's right. If you look at verse 1 of chapter 14, God told Moses. He said, Pharaoh, he says, I want you to camp by the sea. Because Pharaoh will think that you're wandering around the land in confusion. He will think that you're hemmed in by the sea, and his heart is so hard that he's going to come after you. That's what he, and so Moses already knew that something was about to happen. He knew that, number one, God brought them to that place, right there by the sea, hemmed in. He knew, number two, that the Egyptian army was coming. He knew, number three, that they were not physically able to defeat that army, and so he knew that God also was not going to let the Egyptian army take them back to Egypt. So there were really only two options in Moses' mind. Either God was going to deal with that army or somehow God was going to deal with that sea. Moses was probably just trying to wrap his mind around the situation. Have you ever been there? Have you ever just tried to wrap your mind around the situation while you're in the presence of people? I've been there. I've been saying to myself sometimes in meetings or I've said to myself in certain situations, God, what are you going to do? God, you got to do something right now. What in the, I believe Moses was saying, I, I, I believe God is going to deal with that water somehow, but I also believe that God is somehow going to deal with that army, all right? And so when the people started crying out in fear, Bible says Moses to his credit, he stood up. He says, do not be afraid. All right, you stand still. You be quiet and you see the salvation of the Lord because this army that is coming after you today, you will never see them again. Isn't that something? Moses had that faith. He knew that God was going to do something. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I believe that God had already dropped in Moses' spirit what needed to be done but perhaps Moses hesitated, and he was reluctant. And so he began to cry out to the Lord for himself. And then the Lord says in our text, he says, why are you crying out to me, right? You know what to do. I've already shown you what to do. You tell the people to move forward, all right? Raise your staff, stretch out your hand, divide the sea, and the people will go through on dry ground. You know, however, you know, I don't know, however it might have happened, Inwardly with Moses, God made sure that Moses understood that it wasn't the time, here I am as a preacher, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't the time to pray in the traditional sense, but it was a time to take action. Do you follow what I'm saying? God wanted Moses, just like he wants us, to be a conduit of his will. He wants us not to be just hearers of the word, but he wants us to be doers of the word as well. He wanted Moses, just like he wants us, I believe, to be a pipeline through which his power can flow, right? So on that day, Moses partnered with God, and he performed one of the greatest miracles of deliverance that this world has ever seen, right? I believe like Moses, many times we cry out to God, we hesitate, we remain, we remain stationary when we should move forward and act if we know that God is with us, right? Perhaps you know, perhaps you might know it's time, and this is an example, perhaps you might know it's time for you to leave your job and branch out on your own so that you can help your own community. But for whatever reason, 
because of the risks that are involved, you are hesitating and you're still praying about it. Huh? Now, I'm not saying that you should do anything haphazardly, but I am saying that, that some of our places of prayer are really places of procrastination and hesitation and reluctance and fear because we really don't want to step out on God's word. We really are not sure if God is going to back us up or not. That is right there, huh? Furthermore, furthermore, I believe looking at this text, I believe when you look at this text that every place God leads us is a setup to bring about the enemy's defeat. That's right. I think that as sons and daughters of God, we are always in a unique position and we always have unique opportunities to represent and to glorify God. That's right. Even if you've been fired from your job, you have an opportunity to glorify God. Right? Even if things are looking bad in your family, in your marriage, you still have an opportunity to glorify God. Huh? Even when you have your backs up against the wall, or in this case the sea, God will always position you in such a way that if you are mindful of his presence, if you're mindful of his goodness and mercy that David said will never leave you, God has put you even there in a position to partner with him and bring glory to his name. And you know, sometimes, sometimes the more difficult the situation, the greater the glory. <laughs> the more difficult the situation, the greater. You can't really find a miracle much better than this, that when their backs were against the sea and the army was coming towards them, that God told them to stretch out that staff. And he sent a strong east wind. It says all night long, and he blew those waters back to the waters on the right hand, and they were on the left side, and they walked through that sea on dry ground. Sometimes the more difficult the situation, the greater the glory. Now, many times, just like Moses, and sometimes just like Joshua, we already know God's will. But the fact of the matter is we need to do our part in making God's will a reality. You know, it's like I said uh, uh, last Wednesday in our Bible study. You know, a lot of times when people wrong us, and uh, they do something to us, you know, our feelings get all up in the way, right? And then we begin to wonder and we struggle with what we should do and how we should respond to that particular individual. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we don't need to pray or cry out to God about whether we should forgive them or not, because God has already given us the answer to that. And the answer is, we should forgive others just as God has forgiven us. You see what I'm saying? Uh, we up there struggling and, and moaning and crying out to God, but the Word of God has already said what we ought to do, right? You know, sometimes people will come to us, all right, and, and, and they might need something. They say, brother, can you help me with this? Or, or brother, can you help me with that? And, you know, we start, you know, I don't know if this brother is right or not. I don't know if they're going to use it or not. But let me tell you something. If you do what God has said, it really doesn't matter with what they do with the money. The Bible says if you give, it will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be placed in your bosom. I'm just trying to tell you what the words say. <laughs> I mean, I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. Uh, probably more so than you, week after week sometimes, day after day. Brother, can you give me a little chance? Brother, can you have me a But I'm just here to tell you, if you give it, God will make sure that he gives it back to you. Isn't that something? Now, now the same thing happened to Joshua in Joshua chapter 7, but it happened to him in a different way. The Bible says that after they were defeated, the Israelites were defeated, Joshua at that point, he fell down on his face. And he began to wonder if he had heard God and and, and he began to wonder if he should, stay, should have stayed on the other side of the Jordan instead of entering the promised land. I mean, all kinds of doubts and fears began to assail his mind. Has that ever happened to anybody in here? But the Lord, but the Lord made it clear. The Lord had made it clear. The Lord had already spoken. The Lord had already made a commandment okay, that certain things were to be destroyed and they were not to be taken as loot in battle. And so when Joshua fell down on his feet before the Lord and tore his clothes and began to cry out to God, God said, stand up. 
What are you doing down there on your faith? Like he said to Moses, in other words, why are you crying out to me? He said the reason Israel has been defeated is because they violated my word. They violated what I had already told them to do. He said, now, if you just get up and do what I have told you to do in situations like this, then once again, you will be victorious, right? So now listen, sometimes prayer, I, I don't know how, let's see. Sometimes the, the formal way of praying is not what is needed. Even though Paul said pray without ceasing, all right? So I'm here to tell you, you ought to pray without ceasing. There should always be an attitude of prayer. Uh, there should always be an atmosphere of prayer around you. Everything you should do should be done with a prayer without attitude. But, but, but in all cases, I guess what I'm trying to say is obedience and following the word of God, that's always needed. You see, obedience ought to be the result or the byproduct or the produce or the fruit of your prayers, right? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So, so sometimes you don't need to get down on your knees, like I said, and cry out to God whether you should forgive somebody or not because God has already stated in his word, right? Psalm 119 uh, verse 105 says, Your word, Lord, is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. You know, I've been around in different religious set settings, and you know, you have people who always talk about, you know, oh, I just need a leading from the Holy Spirit. I, I, I just need a lead. Sometimes you don't need a leading. You just need to follow what the Word of God says, right? You, you don't need a leading. You just need to do what God has already spoken. Let the Word of God lead you, see? James chapter 1 verse 22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. But he goes on and he says, do what the word says. Huh? Psalm 119 verse 9 says, how can a young man stay on the path of purity? He says, by doing what? By living according to your word. God said to Moses, God said to Joshua in a sense, and God says to us sometimes, why are you crying out to me? I have already told you what needs to be done, and I have promised to be with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. The doors of the church are open. <laughs> the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to become a part of us. We're not a perfect church, but we're striving to be all that God would have us to be. If, if you don't have a church home, why don't you join? You can join right now as we sing the hymn of invitation. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, and this is critical, this is most important. If you don't know Jesus, you need to get right with the Lord. You need, you need to ask the Lord Jesus to come into your life. He's already, in a sense, forgiven you of your sins on the cross. He died for you, but you've got to accept this free act of forgiveness and grace and mercy. And if you do that, not only will the Lord save you, but he will bring you into his family. He will bring you into his kingdom. And I'm here to tell you, come what will, come what may in this life, you will always be safe because of the blood of Jesus. We invite you to come.